Hey guys, uh, so this is a video to finish up, I hope, chapter 10. So here we go. All right, so we're gonna, beginning, we're gonna be beginning on the study guide at South Carolina, the Tariff of Abominations and Nullification. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be covering the next like four items kind of together because they all kind of go together. Uh, the gist of this situation is uh, Congress controlled by the Whigs, led by Henry Clay, pushed uh, um, past a really, really high tariff, uh, the highest tariff that the U.S. had ever seen up to that point, um, and actually the highest that it's ever been in our history. So you can see the history of tariffs here um, on, uh, from 1820 to 2000, um, and you can see how high it was. So um, this tariff uh, was uh, made to promote uh, domestic manufacturing and jobs in the north where the Whigs are really powerful but it is really not great for um, people in the for slave owners in the south and for farmers in general but especially for slave owners in the south this is very hard on them because countries that buy American cotton are going to raise their tariffs in retaliation um, so the tariff abominations as the as it becomes called by its opponents becomes very controversial um, and uh, what ends up happening is the South Carolina legislature threatens to nullify it. Uh, by nullify, they mean we won't pay it. Now, uh, like as in any imports coming into uh, the ports in South Carolina, which would basically just be Charleston, right? We're not going to collect the tariff on them. Um, so uh, their basis for this is that unpublished Kentucky resolution that we learned about in chapter eight by uh, Thomas Jefferson in response to the uh, Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, and um, <clears throat> the uh, remember we talked about that Jefferson had argued that states had the right to nullify or just not follow laws that they believed were unconstitutional. We talked about how while on the one hand, Jefferson was right that those laws were very unconstitutional, on the other hand, this is a very dangerous idea because it would allow states to just ignore any law they don't want to. And now we're seeing the fruits of that. The tariff of abominations is really high and bad for South Carolina, but there's nothing unconstitutional about it, right? And so we're seeing exactly what happens when states do that. Uh, this brings us to Calhoun's nullification theory. So um, Andrew Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun, becomes, uh, is very much in favor of South Carolina's nullification. Andrew Jackson is not. Um, well, we'll get there. Uh, as vice president, he secretly authors a document um, for South Carolina's legislature to use to justify nullification, but it becomes public knowledge that he's the one who wrote it. And this is how his theory works. It's a logical proof that is based on a false premise, but it's still a logical proof. Um, he says, the Constitution is a compact among sovereign states. So in other words, the Constitution is a contract, right? That's what a compact, a, or an agreement, right? But we think of it as a contract between sovereign states, that is between states that are essentially their own independent nations, right? The 13 colonies, the 13 states that came to, sorry, not 13 colonies, the 13 states that came together and ratified the Constitution, they were essentially independent countries ratifying a Constitution, agreeing to a contract. That's what he says. And he says, uh, if that's true, right, then that means that each of those countries, each of those states, has the right to not stick with that contract to um, if the state if the constant if the federal government exceeds the powers of that contract so if you think about it like when we talk about the Declaration of Independence is saying you know liberalism right the concept of liberalism government is a contract where men give up certain rights in exchange for protection of essential rights if the government fails to protect their essential rights then the contract is broken right and so he's essentially saying if the Constitution's a contract, and if the federal government breaks that contract, then the states have a right to not follow it. Now, first of all, 
the idea that the states were sovereign and that the Constitution is just a contract that they can, you know, that they signed, that's not really accurate. Um, and that is that is a belief that some of the Founding Fathers had, but it's not actually the case. Second, uh, the government didn't break the contract. The power to create tariffs is literally the first line of Article One, Section 8. Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, tariffs, et cetera, duties, et cetera. It straight says it right there. That's one of Congress's powers. So we can look at the tariff abominations and say tariff of abominations is an abomination. It's terrible. That's why they call it that. Um, that's not what it was really called. Uh, but you know, this the tariff of it's it's abominable. We can't. It's a terrible tariff, and we might be right. That doesn't make it unconstitutional. So his entire argument is based on two faulty premises. Uh, well, anyway, um, this nullification theory is countered in the Senate by Senator uh, Daniel Webster, who is um, a, one of the leading uh, figures in the Whig party. Um, Daniel Webster makes the argument that, um, <clears throat> that, basically, uh, that basically, yes, the Constitution is a compact, it is a contract between the people, not the states. Um, that the Constitution gets its power from the people, not the states. The people created the Constitution, and then because the federal government represents all the people, the federal government is supreme. And the Constitution backs that up. The Constitution says, first of all, we the people of the United States, blah, 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 do ordain this Constitution, right? It's created by the people, not the states. Secondly, Article, Article 6, Paragraph two, in all matters arising under the Constitution, the uh, powers of the federal government are supreme above the states, or something that knowledge, uh, ex something like that, right? We call this the supremacy clause. So Webster is just, I mean, straight up, he's just right. There's no, uh, there's no way around it. He's right. Um, but anyway, uh, this brings us to the nullification crisis. So all this stuff starts to come to a head. There's a state dinner, um, and uh, basically. Andrew Jackson stands up and gives a toast and he says something like uh, something, you know, petty, something like kind of veiled at Calhoun, like, uh, you know, to our national government, may it reign supreme or something like that. I don't know. May it reign forever or whatever. And Calhoun says, and to the states from whom its power is derived. And so they're very much becoming at odds with each other. Um, and Calhoun ends up then just straight up coming out as the leader of the nullification movement. He um, does not, I, I don't know if he resigns as vice president or just announces that he won't be running for vice president in the next election. Uh, he ends up running for and winning a seat in the US Senate from South Carolina, actually. Um, and uh, this, you know, the nullification crisis begins. South Carolina is pretty much alone in this. Most of the other states, like all the northern states and most of the southern states publicly condemn South Carolina for their nullification idea, saying, hey, we don't like the tariff either, but nullification is basically destroys the fabric of our nation, right? It, doing this like puts the whole thing at risk, so y'all are in the wrong. Um, Jackson, um, it's interesting because I think if Jackson wasn't president, he probably would have agreed with South Carolina. But instead, he views this because he signed the tariff bill. He doesn't like tariffs, but he signed off on the tariff. So he looks at this as a personal challenge to him for his authority as president. And so in 1832, um, uh, what ends up happening is Congress actually backs down and lowers the tariff. And then South Carolina still says, nope, we're not doing it, and they nullify it. And Jackson says, uh, he goes to Congress and gets them to pass a bill called the Force Bill which authorizes the president to use the army and the navy to collect tariffs. And he basically threatens, he's like, if you guys don't start collecting the tariffs, I'm gonna come down there, I'm gonna put you under martial law, and I'm gonna hang a few traitors while I'm at it, right? So he's getting real, things are getting really rough. And what ends up happening is John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay sit down with the governor of South Carolina, 
and the three of them basically come to a compromise that South Carolina will back off on nullification and uh, and Congress will lower the tariff again, which they do. And so the tariff lowers again and again and it steps down. And you can see on the chart here, right, if you look, let me put my, little, I don't know if you can see my cursor. So you see 1828, that's the really high tariff. It ends up not even being put into effect. 1832, we get a much lower tariff and then it lowers again in 34 and then lowers again in, thir in, in 1840. Um, and this is all the Whigs. The Whigs control Congress this entire time. So th this is the Whigs lowering and lowering the tariff, and this is part of their agreement with South Carolina, is to gradually step down the tariff back to before it, like to lower levels than it had been since, gosh, since like Jefferson or Madison. So, um, but what ends up happening then, Calhoun, when he runs for South Carolina Senate, he runs as a Whig, even though politically speaking, he is 100% Democrat, he's gonna run for Whig, and basically, the result of the nullification crisis is um, we're going to have a preview of the Civil War, first of all, right? Of uh, South Carolina. And in, in 1860, South Carolina just straight up secedes, right? And it ends up becoming the Civil War eventually. Um, but also, we end up with this like triumvirate of Whigs, Henry Clay, uh, Daniel Webster, and Democrat turned Whig, John C. Calhoun. And these three guys in Congress are going to work together to oppose Andrew Jackson at every turn, and then Martin Van Buren after him. And they're going to really just like be like a force of opposition to the Democratic Party um, in Congress until they all die in 1850 and 1851. All three of them like die around the same time. But they're going to spend the next like 20 or, or 10, uh, yeah, almost 20 years. Uh, like the next 18 years working together to oppose the Democrats and to specifically Andrew Jackson. Um, all right. So uh, now to a completely different topic, but still not unrelated because we're talking Andrew Jackson. We've got the Indian removal. Uh, first, we talk about Cherokee and assimilation. So uh, the um, there were five tribes that the um, United States government considered to be the five civilized tribes. They were the, uh, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. Sorry, I couldn't, I was making sure I read the right names. Uh, these were Native American groups, uh, uh, Native American nations, tribes, whatever, that had sided with the United States in the War of 1812 and in the American Revolution before that. Um, or just been neutral, um, and who had all made efforts to, to some extent, uh, to assimilate to white American culture as a matter, as a form of survival. And for this, they had been allowed, for the most part, to keep their land. There have been some issues, um, you know, the, there had been the first Seminole War where Andrew Jackson had committed his war crime uh, after the War of 1812 and invaded Spanish-controlled Florida and uh, murdered a number of Seminole Indians, but that had been a, um, a rebel group that had broken off of the Seminole um, called the Red Sticks. Um, and it was like Creeks and Seminole working together, actually, um, who didn't want to assimilate and didn't want to go along with the United States. So that's a different thing. But anyway, they've assimilated, and no group had assimilated to the same extent as the Cherokee. The Cherokee um, nation had developed a written language. This is the um, father of their written language, uh, Sequoia, uh, who he developed what's called the, it's called a syllabary. Um, if any of you have ever studied um, Japanese or Korean or Chinese, um, rather than an alphabet, they use what's called a syllabary, where, um, and it, 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 it's, a, it's a slight distinction, it doesn't matter, point is, um, it's, it's like that. It's similar to hiragana in Japanese. Uh, where each symbol represents a distinct sound, um, whereas in an alphabet, they, it, you know, you can have multiple different sounds for the same symbol, right? Based on how they fit together. Um, but anyway, um, they develop a written language. They had a, uh, I don't think I have a picture of it. They had a bilingual newspaper called the Cherokee Sun, or the Cherokee Phoenix. Yeah, Cherokee Phoenix. Um, I'm getting mixed up with the current newspaper, the Phoenix Sun. Um, but anyway, the Cherokee Phoenix, it was you know, bilingual English and um, Cherokee. They um, had a constitution based on the US Constitution. 
with uh, and, and their tribal government was actually based on the U.S. government with a bicameral legislature and a president and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they adopted mostly white American style of dress. So as you can see here, they kept some elements of traditional dress, such as uh, uh, turbans uh, or a sort of head wrap type turban thing for men um, and uh, these uh, symbols on their chest. Um, again, it's a, a male thing. Um, they uh, adopted American, white American style farming, and some of them even owned slaves, uh, though that was a very small number that did. And uh, they wasn't quite the same as the way slavery is practiced by um, white Americans, but still, it was slavery. I mean, it's still slavery, and slavery is bad. So they did that too. So they had um, really assimilated more than any other group. And they thought that this was going to keep them safe and keep their land safe, but that did not turn out to be the case. Uh, this brings us to the Indian Removal Act. So um, uh, the last resistance of Indians to, the, uh, to whites happened in 1832, actually, um, during Jackson's time. Um, the, uh, a, uh, there was a... a, a uh, a group of Native Americans belonging to two different tribes, the Sauk, S-A-U-K, and the Fox tribes, uh, led by uh, this guy on the left named, uh, this is Black Hawk, who is the leader, and then that on the right is his son, who is more assimilated, uh, named uh, Whirling Thunder. But Black Hawk um, led Native Americans... Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I've got it backwards. Black Hawk is on the right, his son... Whirling Thunder did not assimilate. But anyway, uh, uh, Black Hawk um, uh, led a coalition of Sock and Fox Indians to resist being pushed off their ancestral lands by federal troops and local militia, including Abraham Lincoln. And when we get to Abraham Lincoln in chapter 13, I'm going to tell you a fun story about him in this war. Uh, he didn't kill any Native Americans. But anyway, um, they ended up getting pushed off their land onto reservations. You can see on this map. Uh, they got pushed into what is today Kansas uh, in Nebraska. Um, uh, that, is, uh, that is part of this. Um, but anyway, uh, the Indian Removal Act was passed in 1830, and it allowed federal funds for removing the five civilized tribes, as well as the Sac and Fox, it turned out, um, to uh, what was called the Indian lands in what is today Oklahoma and Kansas. Um, these were reservations put out in the Great Plains uh, in an, an area that's not particularly great for farming do, because it's, it's prone. We do farm it a lot, but it's because of modern irrigation techniques. But it's very prone to drought and flood, tornadoes, um, and lacking in raw materials like wood, for instance, because there's not a lot of trees. Uh, and we move these Indians from their ancestral homelands, which are wet, you know, uh, humid, uh, uh, wetlands, you know, um, areas that are good for growing uh, food, but also cotton and things like that, and move them to these lands. Um, and there's a number of reasons around this, uh, but they mostly pertained to uh, the cotton boom and the demand for increased land on their uh, in, uh, for cotton because the Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw are right in the middle of the Black Belt, that area that we talked about last week where the soil is really dark and rich and good for growing cotton. And so um, there's that. But also gold was discovered on Cherokee land, and that's part of it also. Um, and so Congress had passed this law, which Jackson pushed and supported even after the Supreme Court um, seemed to be overturning it uh, and pushed for what eventually became the Trail of Tears, we'll talk about in a moment. But first, we have three Supreme Court cases. And these three, you need to know for this chapter to kind of understand it. They are not the kind that I would expect you by the end of the school year to still remember the way I really hope at the end of the school year you still remember um, you know, McCullough versus Maryland and, uh, and Marbury versus Madison, right? Uh, but they are important. We have three of them, and they're all three kind of similar. So I want to make sure that we cover all three. First, we have Johnson versus McIntosh. Supreme Court, uh, and this is 1823, and the dates do matter here because you see a change in the way the Supreme Court rules, even though this is John Marshall in all three rulings. Uh, so first we have 1823, uh, Johnson versus McIntosh. 
the Supreme Court ruled that Native Americans do not actually own their land. That land is owned by the federal government, and the Native Americans just have occupancy rights on that land. Then, 1831, we have Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. This is the official case where the Cherokee Nation is opposing the Indian Removal Act. Uh, and the Supreme Court ruled that Native Americans are wards of the federal government, not citizens, and thus have no legal standing in court. And then, the very next year, though, they seem to kind of reverse themselves in Worcester versus Georgia. In Worcester versus Georgia, 1832, they ruled that Native American tribes, Native, Native American nations, or Indian nations, as they called them, were a distinct people with a separate political identity and that the federal government thus was the only uh, group that was allowed to deal with them. Now, what this comes down to is Congress had passed a law allowing federal money to remove Native Americans, but at this point it was still only being done by the states. The state of Georgia was trying to use federal funding and the militia to forcibly remove the Cherokee from their land. The Cherokee are suing saying you can't do that. And so in the second ruling, right, um, uh, or I'm sorry, in the first ruling, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, I mean Johnson versus McIntosh, which predates the Indian Removal Act but does not predate attempts to move them off their land, the Supreme Court had ruled that they uh, don't own their land, they just have occupancy rights, but they're still saying the federal government's over them. In Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, they're saying they're not citizens, they're wards of the federal government, but again, they're saying only the federal government can deal with them. And in 1832, Worcester versus Georgia, again, they're saying Native Americans only the federal government could deal with them. So that's the, the common strain. So what I, would, what I would say on a test, for instance, I might say in the cases of Johnson versus McIntosh, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, and Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court upheld the idea that, and the answer is, Native Americans can only be dealt with by the federal government. In each of these cases, we have a slightly different ruling, but they all boil down to that. And Andrew Jackson was said to have said, but there's no evidence he actually said it, this was a, um, uh, an editorial criticizing him, said that he said, Mr. Marshall has made his ruling, now let us see him enforce it. There's no evidence he actually said that, but still, that's what people thought he said. Point is, is Jackson still authorized federal troops to assist Georgia in removing the Native Americans. And so we have the forced removal of the Choctaw in 1830, the Chickasaw and the Fox and the Sauk in 1832, the Creek in 1832, the Seminole in 1832, and the Cherokee, who were the ones who sued and sued and sued and tried to oppose this, they finally are forcibly removed in 1835. And this, this uh, mass movement of Native Americans to Indian lands um, the last one, the one of the Cherokee, is known as the Trail of Tears be, uh, because on the Trail of Tears, something in the neighborhood of about four, uh, I think it's something like 4,000, no, um, let's see, 18,000 18, Cherokee were removed to the Indian lands and about a fourth of them died on the way. So about a fourth of 1,800, so about 4,500. So, Right? No, 4,200? So anyway, over 4,000 people died on the march because they walked them by land very brief, very, very briskly, regardless of weather conditions, etc. So very bad times. Very, very bad. Uh, the Seminole, actually, a group of the Seminole resisted this, and we end up with the Second Seminole War. That's our next item on the study guide. Um, a survivor of Andrew Jackson's Red Stick campaign named Osceola, O-S-C-E-O-L-A, Osceola led the Seminole and their fugitive slave allies against the U.S. government. About 1,500 uh, American militia were killed, about 1,500 Native Americans were killed, and about 3,500, or about 3,000 Native Americans and 500 of their fugitive slave allies were um, agreed to be removed by boat to the Indian lands in 1832. So 
the 3,000 Seminole who went to what is today um, Oklahoma went willingly as a peace agreement at the end of this war, and they brought with them 500 fugitive slaves who were given their freedom. So um, these 500, what had happened is uh, 500, um, uh, a lot of fugitive slaves in Florida had been joining the Seminole and running away from plantations in Florida and joining the Seminole. Um, a, an unknown number of Seminole Indians and their uh, black allies remained in Florida, um, hiding in the swamps and the forest, uh, never to be uh, discovered and gotten rid of. Um, all right, so there you go. That is the Indian removal in the Second Seminole War. And this brings it, so we have three major events in this chapter, right? We got the election of 1828 that gives us, uh, the election of 1824, which gives us the Democratic Party, right? We've got the Indian removal that we just spent all this time talking about. Of course, there's also the nullification crisis. So I guess that's three things. And now our fourth big, big, big deal of the chapter is the bank war, where Andrew Jackson and the Democrats do everything they can to destroy the economy and do a pretty good job of it, as we'll see. All right, um, we get some fun political cartoons out of it. Um, all right, so let's talk about the bank war, which is the subject of potential essay question number two, I believe. Yes, causes, events, and effects of the bank war. You've got to know this stuff, and I know it seems kind of boring. you got to know about it. Um, if you're on the multiple choice part of the study guide, this will cover bank war, pet banks, species circular, panic of 1837, four items. Study guide, it's, uh, or essay section, it's just, we're going to do it all together, all right? Okay, so... As we learned, in 1816, the bank was renewed for another 20-year charter. So it starts again in 1816. It's set to expire in 1836. We also know that the bank, the second bank in the United States, pretty much, if not caused the Panic of 1819, it definitely exacerbated the Panic of 1819, and at the very least, failed to do anything about the Panic of 1819 like it should have. It should have been able to prevent it, or at least it should have been able to curtail it. And instead, it not only didn't prevent it, it made it worse, right? So that's got a lot of people on, and specifically the Democrats, who are opposed to the National Bank because of this. Andrew Jackson, in particular, lost a lot of his money in the Panic of 1819 because he speculated. He bought a bunch of Western land, that's why. But still, he had to sell his slave trading business because of it. Poor guy, right? So he's got a personal beef against the bank, too. On top of that, you got Henry Clay specifically, but the Whigs in general, but Henry Clay specifically, wanting to do anything they can to get Andrew Jackson, to really take him down, especially to stop him from winning re-election in 1832. Um, now, after the Panic of 1819, the, so we've got some causes there. Sorry, we've got causes, right? We, you know, the Panic of 1819, the Democrats general opposition to National Bank anyway, Andrew Jackson's personal beef, right? Um, we got a fourth thing that happens, and that is in 1832, an election year, the, um, oh, well, let me back up. Uh, in 1820, following the Panic of 1819, Congress had fired the president of the National Bank and replaced him with a guy named Nicholas Biddle, who had been the president of the bank, uh, the State Bank of Pennsylvania. And the Pennsylvania State Bank, you know, Pennsylvania State Bank had been one of the few state banks that had not participated in crazy inflation, and Pennsylvania had done pretty okay during the Panic of 1819 because the State Bank of Pennsylvania had basically done the National Bank's job to prevent inflation and prevent speculation. So Nicholas Biddle is tapped as the new head of the National Bank. He whips him into shape and he makes sure the National Bank actually starts doing its job to prevent inflation and prevent future problems. And under his watch, you know, 12 years have gone by, no problems with the National Bank since then. It's been doing its job, things have been good, inflation's been down. He testifies before Congress, and he ends up getting asked kind of a, a question that he gives a bad answer to. And he essentially is asked, like, something along the lines of, well, couldn't the National Bank just destroy state banks if it wanted to? It has so much power. And he says, oh, we could destroy any bank we want. But we wouldn't. <laughs> it's kind of that kind of situation, and I'm paraphrasing point is, we have a fourth thing, and that is that the president of the National Bank, Nicholas Biddle, 
has said some stuff that makes Democrats worry that the federal, the national bank's becoming too powerful. In fact, Jackson and his supporters start to call the national bank the monster bank. Right? Okay. Uh, and then what happens is Henry Clay decides we're going to go ahead and renew the national bank's 20-year charter now instead of waiting four years. Now, this is the fifth and most probably, you know, one of the most important causes. This is like the, inst uh, you know, think of causes. This is the instigating event. All those other things we talked about, if we could, we take it to like um, uh, the War of 1812, right? These are, you know, impressment and hurting our trade and paying Native Americans to attack us on the borders. But this next thing, this, it, uh, them, re I mean, I'm sorry, them renewing the National Bank early, this is the U.S. invading Canada of the bank war. This is the first opening blow. Um, what happens is Clay says, we're going to go ahead and renew the National Bank early. We're going to, and it won't go into effect until 1836, so it'll still be 1856 before it's going to expire again. We're going to do another 20-year charter, but we're going to pass it now. The reason, you know, the obvious reason is, well, what if we lose the election, we we'll lose control of Congress in, 18, in this election? Then we want to get this done before we lose control. But if that was the case, they could have done it after the election, but before the new Congress comes in. The real reason is he's trying to put paint Andrew Jackson into a corner, right? Because this will basically put Jackson into a position of either he signs off on it, which will be a betrayal of his party, right? And he'll lose the support of his voters of, uh, and his supporters in the party by signing off on this thing that they don't like. Or he vetoes it and, directs, and wrecks the economy and then loses the election because he's wrecked the economy, right? So it's kind of a, a lose-lose for Jackson is what Henry Clay thinks. Jackson brings Henry Clay to the White House is like, hey, listen, cards on the table, do this after the election and I'll consider it. But if you do it now, I'm gonna veto it. I don't want this to be an election issue, don't meet this election issue. Henry Clay says, oh, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but we're doing it now. And so they do it and, hit, and Andrew Jackson vetoes it. Now remember, the founding fathers envisioned the presidential veto as something the president does to stop unconstitutional acts of Congress. If the president thinks Congress has acted unconstitutionally, that's what the veto is for. But that's not what the Constitution says. It just says he can veto laws that he can veto laws. It doesn't say that he can only veto laws that he thinks are unconstitutional, right? Uh, but also, he probably does think it's unconstitutional, right? He probably disagrees with the National Bank anyway. Anyway, he vetoes it. The Whigs really try to push the idea that he's a tyrant and a king, as we see here, trampling on the Constitution and, the dec and, and all that, uh, using the veto as a, as a weapon. Doesn't work. He wins the election of 1832 in another pretty much landslide. And whenever this first happens, he says to Martin Van Buren, who's now become his like best friend, number one confidant, he says, the bank is trying to destroy me, Mr. Van Buren, but I shall destroy it. At least that's what he's quoted as saying. And so he does. And after the election, and he wins his re-election, he uses his federal authority and orders the Secretary of the Treasury to remove all of the nation's money from the National Bank and put it in nine state banks that he's handpicked. The media refer to these as the pet banks because they are his personal little pet banks. Uh, these are banks where the presidents of the banks had donated money to his political campaign and publicly supported him. Uh, and when he's accused of showing favoritism to him, he says, well, yeah, to the victor go the spoils. We won. Now I'm going to reward my supporters. He is openly, completely fine with this. And by the way, this is something every president does, right? Every president, Democrat, Republican, whatever, rewards their supporters, whether they're financial supporters or political, by giving them stuff, right? Whether it be, you know, contracts or government positions, we call this patronage. And it's considered to be just like, yeah, it's the thing we do, but we're supposed to not do it for this nakedly greed reasons like this, right? I mean, didn't Andrew Jackson claim that John Quincy Adams bought the presidency by making Henry Clay Secretary of State? 
and there's no evidence of that, but even if it were true, isn't this like the exact same thing, only purely money-based, right? But anyway, uh, he calls this the spoil system, and so that's what we call this. Um, I didn't put a thing on the study guide for that, but the pet banks fit that. Anyway, so taking the, uh, so his secretary of the treasury refuses to do it, and so Jackson fires him. Jackson appoints, uh, or tells the new secretary of the treasury, the, de the acting secretary of the treasury, the, who had been the deputy secretary, to do it. He, resi he just resigns rather than do it. So then Andrew Jackson appoints a new secretary of the treasury and has him do it. And this guy does it. And Jackson will later reward him right at the end of his presidency when John Marshall dies. Jackson gets to name him to the Supreme Court. And this guy is going to come up again in chapter 13 because he is going to make a Supreme Court ruling that indirectly leads us to the Civil War. It's one of the causes of the Civil War. Very bad, very bad. Um, but we'll learn more about him in chapter 13. So that's the Bank War. Um, we've covered the causes, we've covered the events of it, but now the effects, the final part, the effects. Um, the economy crashes utterly, and we get the Panic of 1837. Massive economic collapse, worse than the Panic of 1819, by like exponentially worse. Very, very bad. Um, depicted in this political cartoon here, uh, right? Uh, blaming Andrew Jackson's policies by making Jackson the sun up here, shining on this, you know, view of poverty and destruction. Um, uh, yeah. So um, the Panic of 1837. So what happens is, with all the federal money in the state banks, the states just start just just issuing tons and tons of loans and printing money also. And what ends up happening is we get this crazy massive inflation and crazy, crazy um, speculation in land. The amount of paper money, get this, the amount of paper money in circulation between when Jackson does this and when he leaves office goes from $10 million to $149 million. That's 100, I mean, I'm sorry, that is 1,500% inflation. That is insane amount of inflation. Prices rose dramatically. Workers' wages do go up, but not commensurate with the cost of living. And so this is what we call real wages go down. Real wages are how much money you make versus how much things cost. And so inflation is so high that even though the amount of money that people are making is going up, the amount that things are costing is going up so much more that it's like the amount of money actually went down. That's called real wages. Their real wages go down. Uh, and so things are getting really, really bad. And so at the very end of his presidency to try to stop all this, Andrew Jackson issues the specie circular. We learn about specie, that means hard money, gold and silver. And what the specie circular does is it says federal money can, I mean, sorry, federal land can only be bought with gold and silver. This causes the high, high, artificially high price of public land, of land in the West to slam right through the basement. And this causes investors to lose hundreds of millions of dollars and turns the panic of 1837 into the panic of 1837. So it turns an already pending financial disaster into the worst financial disaster the U.S. had yet seen. Um, and just in time for Jackson to leave office and everything to get blamed on his successor, Martin Van Buren. So Martin Van Buren, uh, seen here holding a hat to uh, catch the Democratic donkey's turds. By the way, this is the first known instance of a, of a donkey representing the Democratic Party. So we have the Democratic Party being forced forward by Jackson, beating it with a cane, while Martin Van Buren walks behind to catch the turds in his hat. Uh, here's a portrait on the left is a portrait of Martin Van Buren from when he first helped organize the Democratic Party back in 1825. On the right is a photograph of him from the 1840s. So get an idea of what he looked like. Uh, very different from Andrew Jackson. Uh, politically speaking, on the same end of things as Jackson, but he is someone who was born poor, grew up poor to middle class. His dad was a manager of a bar, right? He is the first president not of English ancestry. He's of Dutch ancestry. Um, and he is not a good public speaker. He's very timid and speaks of a soft voice. He's not like this big strapping military guy. He's not a veteran. He's short and stocky and bald and just really 
he's everything Jackson's not when it comes to personality and charisma, but politically he's on the same side of things as Jackson. Though I'd say he's much smarter and more educated, but still. So anyway, we've fully covered the bank war now. We had the causes, we had the events, we had the effects. We've also, on the study guide, we've covered pet banks, the species circular, and the panic of 1837. There's only three things left, but we're at that 40 minute mark. So um, I know that uh, in most of the classes, we're about to run out of time. So I will cover these last three things tomorrow in class. So we're gonna go ahead and stop there at the panic of 1837. We'll cover Van Buren's presidency and the election of 1840 and all that tomorrow. So thank you guys so much. Be good for Miss White. And uh, I'll see you later. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.